Good afternoon. Um, today, uh, for the next little while, we're going to talk about logistics. There are 20 slides, so this may take a few. Uh, there's a lot to talk about and a lot to get through. Um, we'll start, Rob. I'm going to go ahead and dive right in because we need to get this finished uh, pretty quickly. So, um, there is nothing more intense in the human experience than war. Everything depends on who wins and who loses. And who wins and who loses depends on logistics. So, um, let's look at some, some quotes from some famous uh, business and military experts. Sun Tzu w wrote a uh, quintessential book on war and or business, depending on how it's interpreted. And he said, the line between order and disorder lies in logistics. Um, at the bottom, you'll see uh, General and later President Eisenhower you will not find it difficult to prove that battles, campaigns, and even wars have been won or lost primarily because of logistics. And Tom Peters, who is a uh, modern-day visionary um, in the business world, said, Leaders win through logistics. Vision, surely. Strategy, yes. But when you go to war, you need to have both toilet paper and bullets at the right place at the right time. In other words, you must win through superior logistics. So that means that logistics is going to be a pretty important part of your business plan. So we should look at what logistics is. Logistics is the management of the flow of resources between the point of origin and the point of consumption. Logistics is as important to business as it is to armies. Uh, companies that win war in, that win the war in the marketplace are those that compete better on the ground. Um, logistics is all about um, ground competition. It's all about what gets done and how it gets done. And they say that execution is what separates winners from losers. Actually doing something and doing it well. How well you do it. Logistics is all about the who, what, when, and how of execution. So it's, a, it's an important component. Um, logistics is far more important than just finding a warehouse or a truck. Uh, it's so important that Peter Drucker, way back in 1962, described uh, logistics as the economy's dark continent. What he was saying was that it's huge and that the ability to leverage logistics for profit is going to be a big driver in the, in the future. And as time has gone on, like most things Peter Drucker has said, we found out that he's pretty right. Um, so logistics is part of your operations plan. So op what then are operations? Operations are what you do and how you do it. Um, and operations are important for a couple reasons. One reason is whoever reads your business plan might not understand your market, your industry, your company, anything like that. And this section will help to clarify that for them and also for you. Um, it will also make the key factors that are involved obvious. As you work through the, uh, the uh, operations section, you'll see that certain things pop out and those are the things that you'll need to pay attention to. And they will help you to figure out how to make your business more successful and profitable. As a matter of fact, your competitive advantage might come from the work you do in the operations sections because efficiencies in your day-to-day -day operations can lead to a competitive advantage. Um, for instance, Walmart uh, describes itself as a logistics company that finds operational efficiencies to drive down prices. In that, uh, in that way, they, uh, they don't say they're a store at all. They're primarily in the business of getting products from somewhere to somewhere else. That's more important to them than the stores as far as from a profit standpoint. Now, that's not the only way that Walmart self-identifies. They uh, also think of themselves as a store and a customer service organization and so on. But it's important to know that they think 
very, very deeply and very often about their logistics. Okay, so in your operations plan, you're going to address a lot of different questions. Uh, you may have noticed in the textbook on page 193, the outline of the business plan. They have a production plan and an operations plan. You can make both of those if you want, or you can put them all in the operations plan. Um, all of the same questions are going to need to be answered. Uh, it's just how you feel most comfortable putting the information out there. You probably won't have, though, an individual uh, section of your plan labeled logistics. You'll have uh, the logistical issues as part of your individual, as part of your plan in the section, in the area that they're, uh, they're important. For instance, when you're talking about suppliers, you'll have the logistics of dealing with your suppliers. Uh, when you're talking about um, your customers, you'll have, you'll have it in there and so on and so forth. Uh, so, the question becomes, are you going to compete on operations? Uh, if you are, then this is going to be a big part of your business plan. If you're not competing on operations, that is, if you're running your business in such a way as you're not really doing what you do differently from an operations standpoint, then this may be a less important part of your plan. If you are competing on operations, you need to think, how am I different, better, faster, stronger? How am I more efficient? What is it that makes it important that makes operations important and how am I using it to my advantage. Okay, so what all should be in your operations plan? Well, several things. First, where do you get your supplies? How is your product made? Do you make it? Does somebody else make it? How do you get your product to your customers? Now, this will include all your systems, processes and operational controls. And right now you're probably saying, what are systems, processes, and operational controls? If you're saying that, don't worry. We're going to get to that. That will become clear through this. And if it's not, we can address it in more depth in class. But it'll become clear as we go through this. Uh, the last thing is uh, your location and regulations is going to be important. And the operations plan is a good place to have that. Uh, you know, your building, um, zoning ordinances, so on and so forth. And we'll get more into that in a little while, too. Um, but first, let's look at um, the operations uh, part of this by going to an example. Um, dragonfly corals. Um, they grow several types of ocean coral that was previously only available through reef harvesting. That is, uh, scuba divers would go out and break it off a coral reef and then bring it up and sell it. Obviously, that destroys reefs. Um, Dragonfly is in Noblesville, Indiana, which is a great place to buy coral, right? <laughs> right in the middle of the Midwest. But, but Dragonfly Coral does provide the Midwest with environmentally friendly, economically viable coral for ocean reef type fish tanks. The product, just having the product available and being able to do it and doing it in an environmentally friendly manner made this a good business. But to grow, they really needed to answer several logistical questions. And so a student team asked them to, to examine some things. So how much coral could they grow with their present setup? That's a question that leads to capacity. And any business that you're in, you should know your capacity. If you're a diner or a food truck, you should know how many meals you can put through in an hour. If you have a sit-down restaurant, a measure of capacity is um, a turnover. How long does it take you to turn over a table and how many times can you do that in a day? And turnover means customer comes in, eats their food, pays their bill, and leaves. It doesn't mean flip it, obviously. Um, ha does their available capacity satisfy market demand? If not, how can they get there? Um, do they need more people? Do they need more greenhouses? They grow coral in greenhouses. It's underwater, but it's in a greenhouse. Um, do they need more land? Uh, do they need to train new people to do this? Right now, this business, um, one of the co-owners, Karen, does all the harvesting. And this knowledge needs to be transferred to employees if they're going to expand. 
and shipping. Does a disproportionate amount of the business come from one, one part of the country over another? Are they getting a lot of orders from California or a lot of orders from Kansas or a lot of orders from Alabama? If they knew that, then they would be able to answer the question, would it make sense to have a warehouse in that area? Um, also, can you warehouse coral? Um, would they have to grow it on site? Can it be shipped long distances? Um, if it is, what's the shipping process? If they're going to have a warehouse in a location uh, away from central Indiana, should they have a, uh, their own special vehicle for transportation? Should they take the stuff directly to stores and homes? Or uh, can they just use FedEx or UPS or whoever? It is this type of systematic thinking about capacity, operations, and delivery that every company should be doing. You should be doing this about your country. So, it, or country, your company. In the case of your particular business, you should be asking, how long does it take to make a single unit of whatever it is you make? Uh, how much does it cost to make a single unit of whatever you make? When will you be able to start offering your product and service? Now these questions, um, if you refer back to your prototype, should be a lot easier to answer. Now you think about how long did it take to make my prototype? How much did it cost to make my prototype? How long do I think it's going to be from prototype to production model? Um, how long does it take in order to reach you? When you order supplies, can you get them in two days, three days, five days, two weeks? Um, if uh, you're ordering a finished product, how long is it going to be until um, it's manufactured? Uh, once you get the stuff, how long is it going to sit on your shelf before you ship it out? What is the total time from the time the customer, say, calls you up or places an order on the internet to the customer getting the product? How long does that take? And how, how long does it take to get paid? Are you getting paid before the product gets there? Are you getting paid immediately upon receipt? Are you getting paid in 30 days? Figuring out all of this stuff and putting it in a chart will help you to understand your business and find efficiencies. I've got a couple flow charts that I want you to look at. They're not meant to be complete or accurate, and they're not meant to be the only type of chart you might have in your business plan, but they give you sort of an idea of how this might work. Um, so on the left, we have a flow chart here for uh, a baker, um, for someone who's selling cookies. Their cookies are individually made and individually um, delivered, uh, sorry, in, in their store. So someone orders a cookie and then uh, they wash up and mix up the dough uh, batter, I guess it is for cookies, and I spoon it uh, onto um, a tray. They heat their oven up, which they've got an amazing oven, I guess, that heats up in one minute. That's much better than the oven at my house. Uh, it takes nine minutes to bake the cookies, five minutes for the cookies to uh, cool, and then they can pack up the cookies and take the money and give the people their cookies that they can go home with uh, for another three minutes. So what we see there is a 26 minute elapsed time between the order being cooked uh, and, and or between the order being taken and the delivery. So the question that they would have to ask themselves is will people walk into my shop and wait 26 minutes for a cookie? Maybe they will, maybe they won't. You find that out by asking. Uh, you When you're doing your surveys you say would you wait 26 minutes for a cookie? You wouldn't know to ask that question unless you have gone through this process and created an operations flowchart and saw that might be a potential problem. If you then find out that that is a potential problem and people aren't going to wait 26 minutes for a cookie, there's all sorts of stuff that you can do to cut that time down. You can have the cookies pre-made um, and ready to bake. You could even have them pre-baked and then just warm them on demand. And if you, uh, if you had them pre-made and just warm them on demand, that would cut down your entire order process from 26 minutes to two or three minutes, which probably wouldn't be a problem. Uh, the second example I've got over here 
is Pictionary. When you go through this Pictionary chart, it's how to play Pictionary. So in Pictionary, you draw a picture. Did they guess it? Yes, you win. Did they guess it? No. Well, then you just point at the same picture again. Did they guess it? No. Point at the same picture again. Now, if you've actually played Pictionary, uh, this happens. It's not how it's supposed to be. You're supposed to draw clues and that sort of stuff. And in a lot of times, it's really fun. But you can get stuck in this loop with, uh, with doing the same thing over and over again. Now, that's not um, a problem in a game. But in, in real life, in your business, just by charting out what you do, you might see some sort of a setup like this, some sort of a thing that this problem will not get solved and I'll just keep going around and around in a circle. And if you see that, then that's something you know you have to address. So that's the purpose of this exercise. That will help you very much be able to address these things. Okay, so, um, obviously, um, you need to, for your business, know what you're doing and you need to demonstrate that you know what you're going to be doing in your business plan. So you're going to want to have your hours, your days. Uh, if you remember previously we talked about seasonality. If your business is seasonal, you can address that also in your operations plan. Um, what computer systems are you, are you planning to use, if any, to receive and place orders, uh, do accounting, payroll, that sort of thing. What equipment do you need um, to do whatever it is you want to do? How much does it cost? What are your assets? All of this stuff can go in the operations section. Some of these things we will visit again in the financial section, especially when we talk about equipment needs and um, assets that we have. And also we'll talk about the prices of the computer systems. Those will all be in, in the finance section. Now. Um, I've been hearing lately about this company called Zenefits, www.zenefits.com. It seems like a pretty good one-stop shop for, uh, for human resource stuff. So to handle payroll, uh, to handle insurance, to handle uh, retirement, um, to handle maybe even hiring and firing. I'm not sure of everything they do and this is not an endorsement. I haven't investigated them. But from the commercials, they sound pretty good. Now, if you plan to use a third-party provider like this, you need to do your own research about what they cost, how they work, and what things they do or do not do. You document that, and then you put that in an appendix. And you say, you know, per conversation with Sally at Zenefits, this is what we would pay, blah, 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 blah. Now, the most recent commercial I heard from them said, oh, and by the way, we're free. Um, I don't think that that's probably completely accurate. If it is, then we have to look at how do they make money. And maybe they have a way of doing that um, that works for them. But, you know, it's, it's important to know what resources are out there, and that's one of them. Okay, so this is an example that we're going to work through in class. Um, the example business is called Giant Prints. The idea behind giant prints is that we all have a printer and we can all print our own photographs, but we can't print large format stuff. And when we buy large format stuff, it's uh, a lot of times very expensive. Uh, I've talked in class about the 3D printer they have at the library and um, this business uh, sells things that would be printed in a printer like that on eBay, Amazon, and its own website. It'll print, uh, Giant Prints will sell their own pictures or a picture that the customer provides. And Giant Print will print copyrighted materials, but only after the royalty is paid. That's going to be an issue that I know is going to happen. And uh, probably the way they'll do that is through licensing uh, the image through Shutterstock. Uh, in order to not take on any personal liability. Now, uh, this last thing, Giant Prints leverages the local library to print at a low cost. 
uh, this is going to create some problems and that's fine that's why I'm saying we're going to do it that way what we want to do in class uh, probably Wednesday but whenever we get to it is we want to work through graphically some of the processes the processes of like how does a picture get made how does a customer place an order how do we get the picture to the customer um, how does the supply chain work? For instance, um, what do I do? Uh, what happens? Um, you know, how do I even recruit? How do I even get time at the library? Um, you know, to print this because this is uh, all on reserve. It's uh, it's done at a loss on the library's part, which is uh, this is not really an ethical business, and I really wouldn't start it because I'm leveraging a public good for private profit but it'll make a good example so we'll talk our way through it okay um, keeping that you know in the back of your head after this uh, lecture is over you might want to spend some time thinking about that and then we'll deal with it further in class um, I will uh, I will post the class lecture online for people who aren't taking my class and who are watching this uh, this series of videos okay so um, operational controls um, in addition to um, other issues, we need to think about um, how we're going to keep control of things. If you can't measure something, you can't manage it. And uh, operational controls are often things that we can, uh, there are things that we can measure. And it's also, there will be uh, what's called contingency planning involved in this. Uh, first issue that I've got listed here is uh, target inventory. Uh, what is your target inventory and how much inventory will you maintain? Um, if you have too much inventory, then you have to pay for that inventory and you have to have money tied up in the inventory. If you have too little inventory, when your customer calls you and asks for an order, you can't place it. I have been on both sides of that with various businesses and neither one is very good. So you want to figure out the ideal amount of inventory. Um, in my locks, um, also, um, what happens when something goes wrong? Uh, well, one thing that can happen quite frequently is a supplier can't deliver the product you want when you want it. Uh, also, equipment could fail. Uh, there are a million other things, and there's no way you can cover everything but you should show that you have a plan in place for all the major systems that you have. In the locksmith business, suppliers were a huge part of my business. And as a result, I had um, a bunch of suppliers. Uh, McDonald Dash is my primary supplier, but there's also Hoffman, Hardware Sales, Ziploc, uh, US Lock and Supply. There are a ton of other suppliers that I can call if my primary supplier doesn't come through and I have credit with all of those people um, now if a piece of equipment fails how do you handle that in my giant in my giant print business let's say the library says uh, uh, dr. Nelson you can't uh, you can't print these things here because you're selling them and that's not what this is for which would be well within their rights to say and that's what they should say so if I am in this business and I've got all these orders and I can no longer print there, what do I do? And you know, if I have to buy one of those printers, it's $30,000. So I should have a contingency plan. I should probably not be in that business, but let's assume I'm in that business. <coughs> I should definitely have a plan to at least be able to finish the orders that I've received or to get people's money back to them and close down the business. But assuming it's a going concern for a business, uh, I should have a plan that allows me to continue. Uh, if I'm, you know, if I'm printing these things in-house and I have my own printer, I should have a plan for being able to rent or lease a backup printer if something happens. And whatever the major aspects of your business are, you should have plans for dealing with those. If you're selling pizzas, and you have a pizza oven and the pizza oven goes down, what do you do? Um, there's companies that come out and fix such things very quickly, but even very quickly is not quick enough in the lunch business. 
so probably, and as most restaurants that I've seen um, that are in a, in a quick restaurant business have multiple ovens and they keep them all in very good shape and their backup plan is that even if it's not an emergency, when one oven goes, or goes down, they treat it as an emergency and get it done. You will have to figure out for your specific business what is important to have a backup plan for, what is important to have a contingency plan for, and then what that contingency plan is. Um, so some key aspects that we need to go through in a little more depth are um, supply, location, and distribution. Um, so first, supply chain management. Um, Getting your product to the customer goes beyond just inventories and trucks. Um, you should try, if you can in some way or in as many ways as you can, to build a relationship with your supplier, your manufacturer, your distributor. Um, as a matter of fact, supply chain management can be defined as building the relationships that make businesses possible. I've seen that definition in places and it will give you a huge advantage in the market if you do this. Um, my primary provider uh, for my locksmith business, McDonald Dash, will do things for me that they won't do for other people uh, because I have a very long relationship with them. I have always given them um, preferential treatment when it comes to orders and they do things for me because they know that I value them very highly and I have personal relationships with several people that work there. They will fill my orders ahead of my competitors. If they have 20 of something on a shelf and I need 12 of them and, and someone else needs 10, they'll give me the 12 and the other person will just get shorted. Um, this has happened to me before. Um, they give me better pricing than I deserve um, based on the fact that I've been there a long time. You get price breaks with larger quantities that you with larger quantities when you order things and sometimes they give me a price break based on say a hundred of something even if I only order 30 or 40 of them and they just do that to keep my business and because I'm always good with them. Uh, they will rush orders when I need it. Uh, they have several times extended me additional credit and longer credit terms when I've had uh, customers not pay in a timely manner. Uh, they've also uh, gone to bat for me and located things that I couldn't find anywhere I would call them and 10 other suppliers and not be able to uh, locate a specific thing I needed. And they have used their network to find those things for me to make a job that could have been really an expensive failure into a success. And all of this happened because I've built a long-term relationship with them. You won't have a long-term relationship with any company in the beginning, but start out from day one uh, thinking that's what you want to do. Um, Let's say you need to make something. Let's say you came up with the super soaker and you're going to have it manufactured. Um, you probably want, I mean, you could make, um, you could make the super soaker yourself, but then you're going to have to build a factory and it's going to be a long time before you make that money back. So you use a contract manufacturer. Contract manufacturers will have economies of scale with the suppliers, in this case, plastic and small metal parts. Um, they will be specialists by industry, so you're going to be using a, a plastic molding factory or something like that. Um, and they will make a markup on what they sell you. Uh, but that markup will be a lot smaller and it'll be a lot easier to pay than say a $30 million upfront cost for making a factory. So that's why you would go with a contract manufacturer. Uh, you might not know any contract manufacturers. So the first step would be to ask leaders in your area, ask people that are in business, uh, or ask the Small Business Development Corporation, which we talked about earlier, for help for your business plan. Ask the SBDC uh, for a referral. Um, or ask someone you know in business, hey, I want to get this thing made out of plastic. Do you know anyone who does that? You might you might find someone because if you have an in if you have an in with these people, then it's going to be much much easier to get the deal done than if you don't. Or you can always find your own. There's a lot of companies I know. Everyone's heard of Alibaba because they recently went public, but they are not the only company that links manufacturers to people who need stuff made. There's a company called Makers Row, 
which is an American company that specializes in um, American factories. So if you want something and you want to be able to say it's made in America, contact Makers Row and Makers Row can hook you up with somebody in the U.S. that will do it. There's also uh, thomasnet.com and globalsources.com you can check into. If none of that works, you can always go to trade shows. We talked about trade shows earlier and all of their usefulness uh, for marketing purposes and that sort of thing. Well, there are also uh, contract manufacturers go to trade shows to solicit to get work. So you can go and, and say, hey, I've got this thing I want made and you can need somebody to help. Uh, you should shop for the best deal. So find one, two, three, four companies and then once uh, you think, hey, they might be good to work with, get a non-disclosure agreement. Now, venture capitalists won't sign one, but um, these contract manufacturers have no problem signing non-disclosure agreements. They do it all the time. And you really, really want one, especially if you're dealing with a foreign company, because uh, quite often certain companies in certain regions of the world will um, take your idea and they will immediately start making a knockoff. Uh, you can usually buy new Callaway golf clubs and new fake Callaway golf clubs on the same day. And that's just one of many, many, many examples. You could buy fake iPhones. Uh, you can buy fake iPhones made to the same quality as the original iPhone and you can also buy fake iPhones that only look like an iPhone but don't work like one at all. Um, so once you uh, once you have uh, some NDAs in place, spell out your needs to the company. Say, this is what I need. And you need to think about what's important. Price is definitely going to be important, but it's probably not the number one important thing. It's very likely that on-time delivery, quality, and reliability will be more important. And remember, you're going to have to trust this partner. They really will have the future of your business in their hands. If they tell you they're going to have something by a certain day and you sell a bunch of them and then they just don't ship, that could ruin your business. Now, it's important to say here, everything being equal, shipping takes longer for overseas companies. And if something goes wrong in an overseas company, it's really, really hard to just knock on their door and say, hey, man, where's my stuff? It's very hard to do that. So that's one uh, tick in the box for a local company. Um, do your due diligence on the company or companies you're considering. After you've figured out, yeah, okay, they're going to be good, then negotiate your best, best deal. Now, while you're doing that, uh, consider them because you have to sell them on your business before they'll make anything for you to sell to your customer. I know that might sound backwards, but um, any time and effort they devote to you, they can't devote to other customers. And like you, they're running a business. It makes sense for them to try and get the best return on their investment. One of their investments is time. So all the time they spend with you, they're not spending with someone else. You're a new company and they're going to be taking a chance on you. But you're going to want to convince them that you're worth the risk. Now let's take a brief digression into financing and uh, talk about a couple things. Even though you're going to try to do, you're going to try to be really nice to your suppliers. It's a couple things. Uh, first, you're, you're going to want to push your suppliers uh, on terms. And what I mean by that is your supplier might want you to pay COD more than likely they'll offer you 30 days to pay. And 30 days to pay seemed like a lot of time, but it's not. You have to get the product, get it out, get it sold, and get paid, unless you have the money to pay for it previously. So you want to push that out to 90 days if you can, so that you can sell what they make for you before you have to pay for it. Now you also want, and this sounds exactly the opposite of what I just said, and I know that, but it's true. You also want to ask for a negotiated discount for early payment. So like 2% in 10 days. Uh, that's really, really important. There's a couple things that you should do, know about that. First, 
if you if you push if you get a 90 days but then you say hey I'd like two percent discount in 10 days that tells them hey this guy's thinking about paying me off really quickly and that may ease the negotiation somewhat also a two percent 10 day discount the annual equivalent interest interest rate for that is 36 percent so if you can get two percent off for 10 day payment you should pay within 10 days and take the 2% once you can afford it. Now, a really aggressive financial person would say you should borrow money to pay for that because the annual equivalent interest rate for a 2% 10-day is 36%. That 2% discount actually works out to being a 30%, 36% annual rate of return. So if you can borrow money at less than 36%, you should really borrow money to pay your invoice off. I will not suggest that you do this because there are all sorts of things that can go wrong. And then if you can't pay um, the loan back, then you have, might have a high interest rate loan. Whereas if you go with a company and you miss the 10%, you have that other 20 days for or the 10 days, you, you have that other 20 days for free. But realize that a 2% discount for 10 days is big. It's not a tiny discount, even though it might seem tiny in the numbers. Um, so it's, it's just more spectacular than it appears. Uh, second, your customers may finance you. Um, a lot of industries, not a lot of industries, but some industries, customers prepay for things. Um, the funeral industry, uh, a lot of their businesses prepay travel and entertainment a lot of that is prepay if you book a cruise you pay for it before you go if uh, you book um, an entertainment experience quite often you pay for it before you go um, you know you obviously pay for a concert ticket before you go to the concert um, now this may not apply to your industry specifically but if you have a product and you want to try to get it prepaid that's kind of the Kickstarter model that's what Kickstarter is, is Kickstarter is a way to um, market test your idea and get prepaid. If you say, you know, if I sell a thousand of these for a hundred bucks a piece, that's a hundred thousand dollars, then, you know, that's a hundred thousand dollars less their fees, obviously, that they'll send to you and that's a prepay. Now, this prepay sometimes is by a long, long, long time. There's a 3D printing com printer company. I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but there are people who prepaid for their 3D printer and didn't receive it for, I think, two years. Maybe dev maybe only a year, but a really, really long time. So you can get, the and now that's not a great way to do business, but you can get money to build and develop your business based on prepay so that you don't necessarily go into debt. Okay, location. We have talked about location, and we're going to talk about it a little more. Um, this is just uh, a little bit more detail of what we've talked about first. Uh, uh, we talked about earlier. Do customers need to visit your location? Now, the reason this is the whole location thing is in this section is because this is where you're going to put it. This is where the big part of the location stuff is going to put this is where you're going to put your uh, your real estate ad or, or a link to your real estate ad or something like that this is where you're going to put you know blueprints and what zoning ordinance you have that sort of thing so for location do your customers need to visit you if no maybe your location is not a big deal you might just work from home uh, you might have a manufacturing facility or a warehouse or something in an area that people don't want to go to and save some money that way um, or if your customers visit you, but it's not part of your marketing strategy, you don't need uh, walk-by, drive-by type businesses, you can also be in a less expensive location. Uh, we talked about a guitar um, teacher. A guitar teacher doesn't, no one walk along the street go, oh, there's a guitar store, I think I'm going to go learn to play guitar. So people will seek you out with some businesses. And if you have the kind of business in which they're going to seek you out, then um, you know you can run it out of your house or you can run it out of a place that's less expensive but if you rely on your location you need to be able to confidently say 
I can make enough money to pay for the location. If you can't, then there's a problem that has to be addressed, and that's why we're writing this business plan, is to address these problems. Uh, what you'll notice with your location is companies in similar industries often cluster close together. You know, it's clustering. Um, typically, you gain more than you lose from being close to your competitors. It's not a mistake when Walgreens opens up across the street from CVS. It's not a mistake when Burger King opens up next to McDonald's um, because customers want to go where there are choices in most businesses. And if you have a location-specific business, you probably want to be where other businesses like you are. Now, as an alternative to that, you can find a place that's becoming the type of place your ideal customer would choose to be. A few years ago, if, if you wanted to start a brewery, just as it was becoming popular, you might want you might have wanted to start an OTR, um, and you could have gotten um, buildings super cheap, started your business, and then as o OTR emerged from, I guess, the ashes of old OTR or whatever. Um, you would look like a genius, and that would be a really good move for you to have made. The next OTR um, might be Walnut Hills, uh, or it might not. <laughs> um, so you might consider, hey, is my business the type of business that would thrive in a, in a location that is like this, or in a location that is becoming like this? Now, um, at your location, uh, there are specific resources that you should consider. Are the type of employees that you need available? Um, because, you know, not everybody can do every job. Um, that's why everybody tries to be the next Silicon Valley. Every community, Winchester, Indiana, I worked with as, a, as an undergraduate student, wanted to be the Silicon Valley of the Midwest. Uh, Winchester, Indiana had a population of less than 10,000 the type of employees that want to work for Silicon Valley type companies don't want to live somewhere where there are 10,000 people. They want, to they want to work and live somewhere that's diverse where they can get, you know, 15 different um, types of fish tacos at 3 in the morning. Uh, they don't need, uh, they don't want to go to a place that has one coffee shop that's not a Starbucks and um, you know, a, a couple little uh, diner restaurants and a McDonald's and that's it. So you, if you were going to start a tech company, might not want to start it in Winchester, Indiana. Um, is the specific location that you're looking at, does it have the things that you need for your company? Does it have you know, the amount of power you need? Does it have uh, access to water? And for a, you know, for a lot of companies, that's not a big deal. For some companies, access to water is huge because they go through gallons and gallons and gallons of it. Uh, access to a river if you're a barge company. Not that we're starting barge companies, but you know, so on and so forth. Um, you know, is there, is, is there enough of, of uh, whatever it is that you need to run your business? Will it be successful at this location? Um, is it allowed to be at this location? Um, if you're starting a factory and you have a house that's zoned residential, uh, you might not be able to do that. They might just say no. Um, I have uh, an associate that I've worked with in the past that tried to start a chocolate company in a house and it took him, after he started his business and ran for about a year and a half, someone decided that they didn't like it and so they shut him down, and it took him a year and a half to get his house rezoned as a place of business so that he could make chocolate in his own home. Uh, now, he was making a lot of chocolate. He had several employees showing up every day, so I'm not saying that it wasn't a legitimate complaint. I'm just saying if you uh, try to run a business in a place where you're not allowed to, there might be problems. If you're dealing with dangerous materials, there are certain places you're not going to be allowed to go, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of that a lot of those types of issues and you need to just address them as you go through. Um, <coughs> for your location, whatever it is, you should probably include a real estate listing, maybe blueprints or a layout of the building you're going to use, uh, copies of the lease, 
uh, what are the zoning restrictions, whatever you think might make a good case for my business can be successful in this location. Uh, last topic is uh, distribution. I used Amazon as sort of a, a general um, tool, but Amazon or some company distributes and markets your product. That is, you've come up with something and you've turned everything over to somebody else. That's the easiest case scenario. So, like, I've decided that I'm going to sell um, cacti. And so I have uh, freeze-dried cacti kits and I give them to Amazon and Amazon decides how they get to places and then Amazon sells them and then I get um, a small percentage of the overall cost or the overall profit because Amazon's doing most of the work, they'll take most of the money. Now, perhaps Amazon or some other service might just market the product. They sell it on their website, but then the order comes to me and then I ship it out. Um, if I have just a few things going out like that, I can use drop shipping. The FedEx guy can come by my house and pick up eight or ten boxes or the UPS guy or whatever. Uh, as my business grows and gets bigger, I'm probably going to want to use uh, an order fulfillment service of some kind. I'll have um, somebody else, uh, I can hire a fulfillment service, I can take them over big truckloads full of my product and they will warehouse it and then when an order comes in, they will ship it out. Um, and these services are varying methods of uh, how complete they are. Some of them will just ship out orders that you send them. Some of them will answer the phone, take the orders, ship them out. Some of them will answer returns. They'll, uh, they'll uh, take product back if there's a problem and then ship a replacement or refund money. Uh, some of them will handle money. Some of them won't. Um, that's another way to handle it. Now you will probably, in almost all circumstances, want to avoid the fixed cost of self-shipping, which is uh, owning trucks, uh, having employees, having a trucking company, having a packaging you know company to package your item probably you're not going to want to own those things uh, you might though and if you do more power to you that's pretty that's uh, perfectly awesome okay so that was uh, the logistics portion of your business plan as you can see from the front page that's business logistics and operations and I hope this is helpful to you and uh, when you have questions, bring them to me and I will, uh, I will answer them in class. Thank you for your time.